Welcome everyone uh, to this webinar uh, that is going to be about how to teach reading. And let's see what we are going to do today. My name is uh, Lutza Birczek and I'm going to be the trainer uh, for today. Let's start with the, the agenda for today. We are going to start with a brief background into teaching reading skills. Then we will move on to the sub skills of reading. We'll also have a look at some common challenges and we'll learn uh, different ways on how to overcome them. Then we will move on to activities, classroom activities ranging from basic to more advanced. Um, uh, and then we are going to talk about how we can uh, engage our students with the learning process and the language and we will close today's session with uh, a few words about how to provide feedback on the reading skills and how to assess it. So let's start with the brief, brief background to teaching reading. The first question should be what do we read in real life so it's not just connected to uh, language learning in general what do we use our reading skills for we read reports letters and proposals we read application forms and questionnaires we read advertisements and notice boards or notices we read non-fiction textbooks and dictionaries uh, we also read fiction, novels, and short stories, and of course we also read newspapers, journals, and magazines. Now, the next question should be why do we read all these? Because obviously we read all these uh, types of uh, communications for different reasons. We read them to get information about something, to make a decision. We read them to perform a task. We read them for specific information. Um, we also consult uh, some of them to know the details of something. Naturally, we read books and uh, fiction to pass time. And uh, we also read to have an overall idea of a certain topic. Now, this is something that I think it's, is important to bear in mind. And as you will see later on in the training, I think it is important that we communicate this to our students as well, that we read for uh, a specific reason. and you know, bearing the purpose in mind, we might have to use and apply different reading sub-skills and strategies. So let's start with a quick uh, and brief background. Reading is an important skill for students for several reasons. First of all, it is an essential uh, part of life. It is essential for certain aspects of life, such as uh, reading a tenancy agreement before we sign it, making a booking on a website, reading the confirmation email that we receive when we go on holiday. It is essential in the classroom as well, since they have to understand the instructions and they also have to understand the feedback that is given uh, on their performance. Um, I also think reading is essential because reading makes for better writing. After all, good writers always read extensively. Um, if you think about all the famous authors, like for example, my favorite author is Ernest Hemingway. We can't really ask him right now, but uh, I know for a fact that he was a big fan of reading and he read extensively before embarking on this journey of writing. So it is very important that uh, students are aware of this fact that if they want to improve their writing they should basically start with reading what other people uh, have written. So reading definitely uh, helps students improve their writing. From a teacher point of view, reading is relatively easy to develop since it does not expose or intimidate students. As a consequence of this, students don't really mind doing it. There is also time to compensate for their occasional lack of language with the help of a dictionary. And as a consequence of all this, uh, reading skills are relatively easy to practice in the classroom. Um, and it is because of this um, that I would like to urge you to focus on the sub-skills. So, go beyond just merely setting a reading task and then checking it for your with your students. Go into details about the reading process. Tell them about the different sub-skills and the different types of reading that they need to employ with a specific task. I always explain, um, before we, we start doing a reading comprehension task, I explain the point of the task. I explain the sub-skill that they need to employ. I, I set them a time, a time frame. Uh, that they need to keep to. So just focus on the details of reading and the sub-skills required. 
Reading is also easy for the students to practice in real life or as part of self-study. Uh, they can find different reading materials anywhere. Uh, they can also find websites on the internet that give them feedback on whether or not they understood the text correctly. So it is a, a relatively easy skill uh, to practice alone as well. So let's start with the four uh, sub-skills or the four types of reading. The first one is scanning, um, which basically means reading for specific information or words. And in practice, it basically means running your eyes through the text to locate certain words. In real life, this type of scanning is regularly used for, and it is, as a consequence, very useful for reading schedules, meeting plans, conference brochures, uh, reading departure boards uh, at the airport, uh, train, ti train timetables or the TV guide. So for example, when you're at the airport and you're trying to find your own flight and whether or not it's been uh, delayed or cancelled or when, whether it's already boarding, you're not really interested in any other flight, you're just basically looking for your own. Or uh, similarly, if you're looking for a specific film and to see which channel it is on and when it starts, you're just looking for that particular film in the TV guide. The other type of reading is skimming which means reading for general information or gist, and this means running your eyes over the text to gather the most important information. And in real life, it's very useful for um, when you're reading business updates on a project, when you basically just want to get a general idea of what happened uh, during the project. Was it successful? We also use it um, when, you're, when we are reading newspapers or news sites for news updates, just to get a general idea of what's going on in the world. We use it also when we are flicking through a magazine to find interesting articles, when we're trying to decide which article we would like to read later on. We also use it when we flick through ads uh, to find something interesting. Mm, the third area is extensive reading, when we read a longer text to obtain a general understanding of uh, the subject. In real life, we use extensive reading skills when we read magazines and articles that interest us, when we read a review of a film we have just seen, when we read a novel uh, in, bed, uh, in bed or before going to bed. So basically, uh, we use extensive reading when we read for pleasure. And the fourth and last type of reading or reading uh, sub-skill is intensive reading. This is when we read something in order to understand everything, so every single word of a text. In real life, we regularly use intensive reading skills when uh, we read a tenancy agreement or any other form of contract before signing it, um, or when we read the cancellation policy for a hotel before making a booking, when we read the instruction manual of any sort of um, electronic devices or flat pack furniture, or when we read a review of a car uh, you are about to buy, for example. Now, um, it is important to bear in mind that um, language examinations are aiming at um, you know, testing language skills that will be useful in real life. Uh, our exam is, is no exception to that. Sitting Guild's exams are trying to uh, build, you know, an examination environment that is testing real life skills and communicative skills. Therefore, we are trying to test the different sub-skills of reading and every other language examina examination system is doing the same. So it's important to bear in mind that these are the four areas of reading that we are using in real life. And as a consequence, these are the areas that language examination systems test. Now, extensive reading is uh, grayed out because that is an area that language examination systems don't generally test. If you think about it, that would be a, a lovely case of, uh, I don't know, a candidate sitting down in an examination room, picking up his or her favorite book, reading it, and then talking about it with, with their friends. Now, this is obviously not something that language examination systems employ, after all, Extensive reading means reading for fun. It's not very easy to test something. We could probably test it by asking them whether or not they enjoyed the book or are they having fun, but this is just not something that's tangible enough for us. So extensive reading is obviously not generally featured in language examinations, but the other three are. 
Now, with regards to uh, to this table, um, obviously whether or not a true or false uh, task is testing, scanning or skimming, uh, reading will depend on the actual specific question because uh, you can find true or false statements um, that are testing general understanding. So just take whatever you can see on the screen right now, it's, sort of, it's just sort of a general guideline kind of thing. Um, Scanning type of reading is usually tested through uh, true or false tasks or multiple choice tasks, open question tasks, uh, find the word that fits the definition task or find the significance of these numbers. So this is when we run our eyes through the text to try to locate the information. Skimming is reading for general information and this is usually tested in, an, in a language examination environment through matching the headings to the paragraph, matching statement, the text to statements, what is the author's stance or attitude. And intensive reading, when we are aiming uh, to understand every single word in a text, uh, is tested through writing a summary of the text or picking a summary for the text or uh, what, again, depending on how difficult the question is, this could also be a, what is the author's stance or attitude. So let's see some activities for, for these reading skills. So extensive reading. This, could, this should be, ideally, reading for fun. Now, as we will see later on, this is slightly problematic because uh, more often than not, I have students who quite simply just tell me that they hate reading. So it is relatively difficult to set them an extensive reading task when they say they don't like reading. But let's see what kind of... Uh, opportunities we can provide them with. Obviously, we can give them uh, abridged versions, so graded readers, we can organize a book club, um, we can raise their awareness about uh, BBC's The Big Read, which was about uh, the most popular books of all time. Um, uh, maybe this will sort of encourage them to at least read the top 10 most popular books or something similar. You can also motivate them uh, by raising their awareness about film adaptations. So, for example, whenever I watch a film, which is very often because I love films, I usually tell them about this, what, what kind of film I've seen and, uh, and whether I would recommend it. And if that film was based on a book, I also recommend uh, that they read the book as well. Uh, if I am currently reading a book uh, that is based on a film, I usually bring it to class and, and recommend it to them. I also regularly send them links to different news sites trying to, um, you know, shift them from reading the news in, in, in their first language into reading it in, um, in English. I also send them articles sometimes asking them to read it just for fun especially if I find something on the internet that I think would be interesting to them. Um, I also tell them about women's magazines. So, For example, if I'm teaching, I don't know, girls who like reading Cosmopolitan, I usually just try to encourage them to stop reading their native language edition of Cosmopolitan and, and move on to the, the original English version of it. I also tell them to read reviews in English, reviews of gadgets, reviews of restaurants, films, um, this kind of thing. And I also encourage them to read scripts by and, and, and read the scripts of films if they are really very interested in, uh, in, in different films. Um, another thing that you can try doing, uh, especially with intermediate or advanced students, is uh, in order to try to motivate them to read extensively, is, um, is a sort of a, a book club kind of thing when students are given access to an online reading material, for example, Project Gutenberg, because it is a copyright-free um, website. Um, and then task one is to select the top five most interesting books. We can uh, do this through an online poll as well, uh, if you want. And then students read uh, their own choice. While reading, they prepare a study guide that you can see on the screen right now. So they, they prepare a short study guide and they will use this study guide to defend their own choice in the form of a book club. There are different variations of this, uh, of this task. You can also uh, do a poll to decide which is the number one most interesting, so the most popular book in the class and you can uh, set them to read 
uh, the same book, so everybody reads the same book and then we, we talk about it. Naturally, this dep depends on time and resources available and obviously um, the level of motivation. Um, how about some tasks uh, to test and teach them about uh, intensive reading? Again, just as a reminder, this is aiming to understand everything. And since this is very important in, uh, in real life, especially if you're teaching students who are trying to or, or aiming to uh, move to an English-speaking country, let's say you're teaching university students who are planning to, to move to, I don't know, the UK for one or two years after they graduate, it is absolutely essential that they become familiar with intensive reading and when to apply it. Intensive reading is also important and, and interesting, I think, because this is the type of reading that students think reading is. So most of my students would do this every day with every task if I didn't tell them other, otherwise. So they think this is reading, aiming to understand everything, using the dictionary all the time to check every single word in a text, trying to understand everything. They don't really understand that there is a place and a time for this. They can do this before signing a contract, but there is no way they will be able to pass a language exam if they want to apply intensive reading for every single reading task in an exam like City and Guilds. So it is important to explain them that yes, this is an existing subskill. You you should uh, apply it for certain aspects of life, but not to all. Um, let's see the activities that you can set them. You can bring a tenancy agreement with some questions. Um, into class and then you can ask them some testing questions such as under what circumstances do you get the deposit back uh, if you sign this rental agreement. Um, you can also set them a match the passenger to the type of airline or hotel <laughs> kind of task where they have to understand the cancellation policy and for example they might say that um, um, a budget airline is not necessarily a good idea for a business traveler because business travelers might want sort of some flexibility. They might want to change the details of flight, which is actually not available uh, for a budget airline um, cancellation policy. So similar tasks like this uh, test intensive reading skills. Uh, the next area is scanning, and let's see uh, how we can we can test it and teach it. This this means looking for specific information. One activity that you could do is bring a newspaper or different newspapers and magazines to class, and you can ask them to locate certain information within the paper. For example, how many headlines are there on the cover? Are there any pages for children? Is there a horoscope section? Which pages carry an advertisement? Uh, which page covers business news? Um, similar activities include locating a text in the course book or a picture or the meaning of a new word. Now, by doing this, uh, you can actually teach them that it is a good idea to apply different reading activities for different tasks because if you time this activity, for example, you will be able to show them how fast this is. Obviously, this is much faster than an intensive reading task. And, um, and this way, you can sort of guide them towards uh, 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 the, sort of the right direction and, and to apply the right exam, in exam strategy when they do an exam. And uh, with regards to sk uh, skimming, obviously, this, is, uh, this involves, uh, usually involves three, three steps. One of them is reading the text quickly. Second one is mentally summarizing the information for later use. The third one is remembering the keywords only, not every detail. And some of the activities that you could do include uh, finding a suitable holiday for a friend. This is especially uh, this is an especially fun activity if you have a very good group with good group dynamics where people know one another very well, and you just pick one person who, for example, I don't know hates sun and a fair-skinned sort of uh, blonde girl who doesn't really like the sun and, and we have to find a suitable holiday for her away from the sea, possibly not in the summer, in November. Now this obviously includes skimming through the, art, uh, through the advertisements, not going into detail. A similar task would be matching CVs to job ads. Again, this could be a very good fun uh, kind of activity to school where we try to match uh, CVs or, or potential 
um, uh, job ads to the people based on what we know about them. Again, if you time this activity, you will be able to teach them that by applying a skimming technique, so not checking every word in a, in a dictionary, just trying to get a general idea, they can save a lot of time. That is why we need to take the time to teach students uh, about this. Now let's put all this into practice, shall we? We, we see a few communicative uh, functions here on the board. Let's go through each and every one of them and let's try to decide what kind of reading this particular communication activity uh, requires. Let's start with uh, the first one, the departure board at the airport. It's, a green, it's the green one on the top uh, left-hand corner of the screen. The departure board at the airport. What kind of reading is this? Please enter your answer in the chat box area. Mm, any ideas? Scanning, skimming, scanning, yes. This is a scanning task. Just to try to, um, if you have already flown before, just imagine yourself standing in front of the departure boards at the airport, happy to go on holiday to London, for example. Are you really that interested in flights to Los Angeles or Melbourne? Of course not. What you're looking for is your own flight. Now, naturally, if there are more than uh, one you know flight if there's more than one one flight to uh, to London you will try to locate the departure time you will also try to locate the airline or your flight number it doesn't make any difference it will still become a scanning activity and if you remember uh, yourself doing this it's a relatively fast kind of reading yeah now let's move on uh, the label on a bottle of jam to find the price Scanning, skimming, intensive, extensive. It's not really skimming because skimming would uh, imply that you have to read through the entire, you know, label and the, every surface of the bottle of a jam. You have to go through it uh, all together, but you don't have to. It's a scanning task. All you're doing is just looking for numbers. We're just looking for that little label that says how much it costs. The same with an expiry date. So if you open the fridge and you're trying to decide what to chuck and what to keep, what you're doing is just making, basically picking up a bottle of jam, having a look at the label, has it already expired or not? We're just looking for a date. And we are actually, our eyes are only looking for, for the date, for numbers. We don't read anything else. We are not going to stop and ponder about the calorie content of, uh, of that particular gem. We're just going to look for the price, or in my later example, we're just going to look for the expiry date. So that's a scanning task, and again, it's very, very fast. Let's see the third one, the blue one. The sports page in the morning newspaper, if you like sports naturally, because if you don't like it, you're just going to skip it altogether. But let's uh, say you like sports. What kind of reading is it going to be? Hmm? Now this one is going to be skimming because what you're basically while you're reading the paper is basically to get a general idea of what's happening in the world of sport. Are you going to stop to check every single word? No, because it's not that important. What you want to know, who lost, who won, what was the score, what happened basically. So it's a, it's a very good case of, uh, of, of skimming, yeah? So basically, if you think about it, it also takes a bit longer yeah, than just checking your flight on the departure board. Skimming takes slightly longer time than scanning because you're, you really do have to read through every article, but you're just skimming through them. You don't stop at every word, you just skim through them. But 
if you're a, a die-hard fan of a certain club, then naturally reading through your sports page would be scanning. Are you with me on this? So if you're a big fan of a certain football club, you're not just going to leisurely skim through the, the articles, you're just going to look for the score of your team. But if you're a general sports fan, this is going to involve skimming. Let's see the, the next one, the brown one, the school notice board to find your exam results. What is it? That's scanning. Very good, Marianne. Thank you. That is scanning. Because, again, just imagine yourself. You have only just passed an exam, and you have to go up uh, to the notice board, and you have to find whether or not you failed or passed. Are you really interested in other people's results? Will you actually start comparing results? No. What you want, first and foremost, is to know whether you passed or not. You will actually, and your eyes will actually, skip through every other information until you find your own name. And this is a very good example that you can give to students because this is exactly what they should do when they are doing um, an exam uh, task which requires scanning. We want them to skip through words, not even pay attention to anything until they find the word that we are looking for. Let's see the next one, the pink one, a new book by your favorite author. Mm -hmm. That is extensive reading, which should ideally mean that you will just read at your own pace, in a leisurely pace, not really paying attention to every detail. You just want to enjoy yourself, and you will probably not use a dictionary either. So there is a book I'm currently reading, and every now and then I find one or two words that I don't know. I don't really care about it, basically, because I'm reading it for fun. I don't check it in a dictionary. I just move on. Sometimes I try to, you know, I, sometimes I can guess it based on context. Sometimes I can't. I don't really care. I'm just re reading for fun. Let's see the next one. A telephone directory to locate uh, and look for someone's phone number. What is it? That is scanning, yeah? Again, we just look through every phone number until we find our friend's name. Let's see the next one, the purple one, the instruction manual that came with your new flat pack furniture. What's it going to be? Now that's going to be intensive. Very good, Barbara. Very good. Yeah. So that's going to be going to have to be intensive reading. Otherwise, you may completely mess up your flat pack furniture. You cannot start you know, working on it unless you fully understand what tools you need, whether, for example, the contents of, uh, of uh, the package are you know, com according to what the instruction manual says. You have to check everything, that, whether you have it. Um, it's like a contract, something similar. So you need to understand every single word bec before you can you know, start uh, working with, with the furniture. Let's see the next one, road signs when looking for your exit on the motorway. That's going to be scanning. Because if you think about it, when you're driving and you're looking for your exit on the motorway, you will not even pay any attention to any signs which signify a restaurant, for example, or a petrol station, because you're not interested in that. You will just look for the sign that says, I don't know, exit here, um, etc. And now let's see the final question, the texts and questions of a language exam. What kind of reading is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is uh, this is a relatively trick question because it depends on the task because we are uh, testing different reading skills with different tasks. So the type of reading that you need to employ with a language exam will basically depend on the task. 
Intensive reading, uh, and I, I agree with you in that, intensive reading should be applied to the questions, not to the texts. But yes, the questions need to be read intensively, checking, well, basically every unknown word, understanding the question fully. But the texts, whether or not we employ intensive skimming or scanning reading, will depend on the task, and we will get to that later, actually. So let's uh, have a few words about uh, how to learn through reading and how our students can learn through reading. First and foremost, they can understand the goal of writing, because more often than not, students struggle with the writing sections of, uh, of language exams. My students very often struggle uh, with the writing sections, uh, not just because it's difficult and not just because it's a skill they don't really use uh, even in their native language, but also because they don't really see the point. Very often they say stuff like, nobody writes letters anymore, why do I have to learn to write an informal or a formal letter? Um, nobody, I don't know, I, I have never ever read a short story, I'm not a writer, why do I have to write short stories or stories? Last time I wrote a composition was in primary school, why do I have to do it again? Now, by making them read these types of texts, you can make them understand that it is actually not true that nobody writes letters anymore. If, uh, if any of you have ever lived in, a, in an English-speaking country, will have, no, will have read a formal letter in English, you might have got it from your bank, your credit card company, I don't know, any kind of, I don't know, utilities uh, company, they do write formal letters in real life and you will have to read them uh, in real life and you might end up working for one of these companies and you will have to write them. So it's not entirely true that nobody writes letters. Um, also with regards to, I don't know, articles and reviews, with the help of the internet, you can actually write a review if you want, I sometimes write reviews. There are these uh, film websites where uh, viewers are um, 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 offered the option to write and submit their own reviews. So, of course, if they want, they can write their own reviews in real life. So they can, uh, by reading, they can understand the goal of writing. They can also learn words in context. Uh, they can also see words in action. They can observe real, authentic grammar. They can observe how paragraphs work. They can observe how linking words work. They can understand coherence and cohesion because they understand that the reason why they understand a book or a text is because there is coherence and cohesion. Um, and finally, they can get inspired. And naturally, before setting them an, an, absolute, uh, an extremely difficult task, it will help them if you show them a good example of, uh, of what you would like them to, to write. Now let's have an example of uh, learning uh, grammar through reading. My first question is, uh, can you tell me what book this excerpt was taken from? What's the book? Yes, so this is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. It's one of my favorite books. But uh, coincidentally, it is also very, very useful for learning grammar through reading authentic texts. Now, this helps uh, in a number of ways. So first and foremost, when I have students who hate reading, uh, I usually tell them, yeah, fine, if you don't want to enjoy reading, that's completely up to you. But reading through reading, you can actually learn grammar. And I usually show them this, uh, this tiny part of this amazing book. It's just the first three paragraphs. And as you can see, it's chock full of a wide range of grammatical structures. And by reading, they can actually understand how grammar works and they can, they can also find, uh, see the, the point of learning different types of grammar because sometimes they feel uh, that the grammar that they're learning is pointless. Sometimes I hear people say, but nobody is using reported speech anymore. This, by the way, is not true. I have uh, native speaker friends. We go out regularly. They do use all rules of reported speech. So I usually tell my students that it's not really true that they're not using it. They are using it. Um, or, for example, by reading through this text, 
they will be able to understand that it's not true that nobody is using the past perfect. Lewis Carroll is using the past perfect right here in front of your very eyes. So they will be able to understand that, yes, there is a point in reading, a, in a learning a wide range of uh, past tenses because they all express something different. Um, and they can also sort of learn how to use this because they will get accustomed to, to the natural and authentic use of these, of these structures. Now let's move on to the next part of this training, which is uh, the challenges part. Some of these challenges are the challenges of my own uh, students, so sort of they are uh, quotes from my own students. Some of them I ask my colleagues uh, about. Let's see. First, uh, one of the most common sentences I hear is, I don't like reading. That's the end of the story for them. Or, I'm too busy to read. After a long day, I have no time or energy to read. Or, I can't help checking every unknown word in a dictionary. I run out of time when I do the reading tasks at the exam. How could I possibly write a story or a composition? I'm not a writer. I don't really know how a dictionary can help me in an exam, so I just don't use it. Let's try to address each and every uh, challenge of, of these. Let's see the first one. I don't really know how a dictionary can help me in an exam, so I just don't use it. Yes, it is true that if they don't know how to use a dictionary, uh, it will not help them at all. Therefore, we really need to take the time uh, to teach them and train them how to use a dictionary, even when we are on a very tight schedule, even when we have to cram a lot of things and materials into one lesson and we have to finish the course book before, I don't know, December. We still have to take the time to teach them about dictionaries. It's not as hard as, as, as sometimes we think it is. I think one or two uh, lessons are, are completely enough. Um, I usually tell them the different parts of an entry. I tell, also tell them about what they can find in the appendix because sometimes they think when, you know, the last word in a dictionary uh, is, is over and done with, this is the end of a uh, dictionary use, obviously it isn't. I also teach them how to use a dictionary for their writing skills, so for example, to check collocations, to check word forms, to check word patterns and prepositions, but I also teach them how they can use it from a reading point of view, because obviously that's different. They don't have to check collocations for a reading. From a reading point of view, the most important thing naturally is to be able to understand how an entry works and what an entry looks like. Um, they need to be able to differentiate first and foremost between the different senses of the same word and which sense they should check when they are checking a word in the text. This can, uh, with this, uh, the sample sentences, the example sentences can help them greatly. Sometimes the example sentence will be very similar, if not equal, to the sentence uh, that they found in the, in the text. So the sample sentences here uh, come in handy. Um, uh, and uh, and th that is why I usually use a screen like this or something similar to teach them about the structure of an entry. Now let's see which number tells students about the pronunciation of the word. As you can see, some parts of the entry have been numbered. It is numbered. Six, which tells us about the spelling of the word. It's number seven. Yeah, number one is tricky. Uh, number one actually tells us what the first word is on the page. Yeah, so number one tells us about the first word of the page. Which number tells us about how we use the word in a sentence? That is number nine, very good, yeah, the sample sentences. And which number tells us about the meaning of the word? That is somewhere high, higher above, it's number three. Very good. So I usually, uh, I, I just usually do this with my students, which is go through uh, analyzing and dissecting the entry. I explain uh, which parts of a monolingual dictionary is useful for the writing. You remember the prepositions, collocations, past tenses. I explain which one is useful for reading, 
which is differentiating between senses, spotting the part of speech in the text so that we actually check the correct part of speech and the corresponding definition and checking uh, the example sentences. This is another type of uh, worksheet that I sometimes use. I just give them this worksheet with some questions. For example, they have to find the three different meanings of fall. They have to find the correct spelling of the noun form of generous. I don't know. Or they have to find the American word for boot. So I just give them this um, worksheet and they have to find the answers in a dictionary. I'm not interested in the answer if they know it by heart. I really am not interested whether they know the answers to this. This task is actually testing their, uh, their dictionary skills and nothing else. And you can also find a few examples here, some of the examples of tasks that I use. One of them is looking, looking for the regular past participles of verbs. The other one is looking for the noun form of these verbs. And there is yet another one is looking for uh, their ability of trying to teach them the ability to uh, locate prepositions. What's the, what preposition do we use after, I don't know, what preposition do we use in front of airport? What preposition do we need after in connection, after defer, after famous? So uh, stuff like this. I, th I think it, it doesn't take more than two minutes or three minutes to solve this task, for example, but it will forever teach them where to look for and what, which entry to go for when they are checking for prepositions. Now, uh, a final area that I use um, or that I teach them to use the dictionary for will be very useful uh, for the writing part of the exam, not for the reading, but let, let me just quickly uh, recap uh, what we are talking about here. This is um, the monolingual dic dictionary's ability to help students find um, more specific synonyms for the generic expressions such as nice, bad, good, sad, interesting, etc. This way uh, you can help them achieve much higher marks for vocabulary in the, in the, in exam, in the exam. Um, this table actually is taken from the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary. It's not presented as a table like this. Obviously, students will have to go to the entry of nice and bad. I just created this summary uh, table for my own students. Uh, you can find this in, in our exam help booklet for writing. So it's, it's, it's in that booklet uh, that is on our website. But uh, it is actually taken from a dictionary. I usually tell my own students that they don't have to learn these words. They just have to know where to look for them uh, when they take the exam. Now just a few words about uh, dictionary use and when to use a dictionary or when not to use a dictionary. The example that I'm giving is B2. Let's see reading part one. It's a scanning type of task uh, so I usually tell my, my students to use the dictionary only on the target language so first they should use the dictionary uh, in the questions to check whether they understand the questions. Um, once they ha have understood the questions, they need to locate some of the words of the questions with a scanning process in the text, underline it and write the number of uh, question next to it and then use the dictionary only on the target language. In reading part two, I actually tell them not to use the dictionary at all. This is a grammar kind of task. It doesn't matter whether they understand the text, they need to have a solid knowledge of grammar, pronominal references and linking words. This is the way they can achieve high marks here, not through the use of a dictionary. Reading part three, I tell them to use the dictionary uh, extensively sort of in the question area. Obviously they need to check everywhere they don't know in the questions and then they have to locate uh, the questions in the texts and they also need to use the dictionary on the target language, only on the area uh, where they found the answer occasionally. But actually, I think for reading part three, the dictionary is mostly useful for the questions. And finally, in reading part three, uh, part four, again, they only have to use uh, the, dictionary, uh, the dictionary on the questions and the target language, since this is also usually uh, testing, scanning type of reading. Now let's move on um, and 
the next problem, if you remember, was I can't help checking every unknown word in a dictionary. This is uh, one of my own students' reaction. He says he cannot stop himself from doing it. He feels like he didn't understand the text if he doesn't check it in a dictionary. And uh, this is also obviously taking away the fun uh, from reading for him and also he's usually running out of time when we do the tasks. So, first and foremost, students need to know when to use the dictionary and when not to use it. They also need to learn how to avoid using it. They can do so by learning how to predict information. Uh, there are quite a lot of course books that already have these prediction tasks built in. For example, in New English File, in almost every reading task, we have this uh, particular um, task where you, they highlight a few words and you need to be able to guess or try to guess the meaning based on context, please make sure that this task is performed without a dictionary. The only point of this task it is to teach them predictive skills, so it's a pointless task if they, well it's not a pointless task obviously because they learn how to use a dictionary but it's a different task if they check it in a dictionary. So if you do it in class, obviously don't let them check the words. If you set it as, a ho as homework, make sure they don't use a dictionary for the prediction tasks. And for the, uh, with regards to the other four types of reading, discourage them from using a dictionary for extensive reading, so when they read for fun. Encourage them to use a dictionary heavily when they do intensive reading. And uh, with regards to scanning and skimming, use dictionary occasionally and only on the target language. Now the next challenge that we, we, have, we had a few moments ago was I run out of time when I do the reading tasks at the exam. In order to overcome this challenge we need to teach them some uh, exam strategies. Let's see the first one. We need to remember the pass rate. In our exam, City and Guilds exams, we have a 50% pass rate. So what this means is that students need to achieve 50% for all parts of the exam. So it doesn't really matter if they uh, have 100% in the reading. If they cannot achieve 50% in the reading section, they won't be able to pass. Therefore, it's important to remember that there are different um, levels of perfection that we should be aiming at. We just want 50% for reading and 50% of writing. We need to bear this in mind, otherwise we won't be able to manage our time correctly. So as an example, uh, reading part one is not very difficult and it's worth five marks. The difficulty is five and, uh, and it is worth five marks. Reading part two, which is the uh, the closed test with the missing uh, sentences is very difficult and obviously this is my subjective judgment of how difficult they are and this is important to remember but based on my own students problems reading part 2 is difficult on a scale of 1 to 10 this is a difficulty of 9 to most of my students but it's only worth 6 marks Reading part 3 is worth 9 marks and it's not difficult at all. Most of our students score very highly on reading part 3, so it's not a difficult task, but is very valuable. And reading part 4 is worth 9 marks, it's the open question task, and the difficulty is, is somewhere in between 6. Now, I think um, it is important to bear this in mind. After all, out of the maximum of 30, students only need 15 marks. So if they can achieve high marks in part 3, they will have already almost passed the exam. They will only need 6 more marks out of the possible, how much is it, 20. So, or something similar. So it is important to bear in mind that, uh, um, that they do have to bear in mind how sort of valuable a certain part is before dedicating 45 minutes on part two because that's actually how much you can spend um, if you don't know how to solve it. So bear in mind the value of parts and also know your time limits. Um, just as some guideline and again this is uh, my own based on my own experience so your own experience might differ from this uh, the average time that students should spend on reading part one is 12 minutes 
the average time that students should spend on the reading part two is between 10 to 12 minutes. It's a difficult task, but it's only worth six marks. It is really not a good idea to spend more than 10 to 12 minutes on this. And uh, since this is a grammar kind of task and you don't need a lot of dictionary use, this should be enough. Reading part three, well, the average time could be 12 minutes, but I actually have quite a lot of students who uh, do this task in six minutes or or less. Sometimes uh, when they are, when you have done a few uh, mock exams, uh, it, this will be enough for them. And the reading part four is between 15 to 18 minutes, depending on how difficult the text is uh, for them and how much uh, dictionary use they need to apply. Now, let's see the other two challenges. Uh, I don't like reading or I'm too busy to read after a long day. I have no time or energy to read. You might have read uh, the article I wrote for the, for the newsletter. Um, this was uh, basically about this problem. How, should, how can we encourage students uh, to start reading? How can we make them like reading? This is obviously a difficult uh, task. Um, but um, it is worth at least giving it a try, since if you actually manage to make them like reading, then your job is basically done. They will uh, read even without you, so it is actually a good idea to give this a shot. Let's see what I usually do. I first and foremost set them an example. How do I set them an example? I usually bring the books that I'm reading to class. I have just recently finished a very, very good book. I brought it to class in English. I you know, they, they uh, had a look at it, they handed it around, they had a look, they read a few sentences to check if they would actually understand it. It was a relatively easy book, actually. Um, it, was, it was interesting. It was, it's a contemporary fiction written by a native speaker, but it's just, somehow it ended up being a relatively easy book to read. Um, I told them how amazing the book was. I told them a brief plot summary. I told them what kind of uh, film adaptation it had last year. It was a very famous feature film last year. And I just told them how much I enjoyed the book. And actually, three of my students <laughs> bought the book in English and they are reading it now. So this sometimes works. It doesn't work with everyone. It doesn't work with every group. But it will work with some people. So set an example. The second one is explain the purpose of reading. You remember the, uh, the Alice's uh, Adventures in Wonderland uh, example. I tell them, even if you don't like reading, it is very useful. And I explain why it is useful. I also give them possibilities. So I explain that, um, that there are different things they can read. This is especially important for the type of people who say, I don't like reading. Because uh, these are the kinds of people who think that reading implies picking up a massive book and reading it from cover to cover. And obviously, this is not the only type of reading they could do. The busy people as well sometimes say, I don't have time to finish a novel. Well, you don't have to read a novel. You can read an article or a review or, I don't know, a few, um, I don't know, short articles or even uh, readers' comments on a certain article. So you don't have to embark on a massive long journey of reading. I also provide them with authentic materials. Now, authentic reading materials are tricky because a lot of people are saying obviously they are too difficult and they are too difficult for A1 and A2 students and possibly a majority of B1 students. But if you have good uh, B1 students or if you have B2 or C1 students, so I would say that uh, from a higher B1 and above, or from a, a, a B2 and above, you can actually give them authentic reading materials. After all, this is a, a reading task. They have uh, the option to read their dictionary, to, to use their dictionary. They have the option to reread and reread until they understand it. So they have a lot of time and they have the help of the dictionary. So it will, more often than not, it will not be that difficult. And what you are actually giving them through authentic reading materials is motivation. Because actually, I remember when I was learning, uh, learning English, and I think I was about 20, I was just getting a bit fed up with the fake and altered and abridged uh, books, uh, texts that I could find in the course books. I didn't want to read graded readers. I didn't want to read 
uh, you know, abridged versions of a book because I felt it was not the real deal. So I wanted to read what everybody else is reading. I didn't want a dumbed down version of my favorite book. I wanted to read my favorite book in original language. So I felt a bit frustrated by having to read, uh, you know, course book texts that I could clearly feel was sort of simplified to my level. So what I basically started doing is just reading authentic materials. And yes, I was struggling for a while, but at least I felt like I was reading what native speakers are reading. So it was really a huge motivating factor, actually. And finally, of course, give them purposeful reading, bring in a, a real life kind of contract or a tenancy agreement, bring in a, a website contents or read websites together. So just give them purposeful reading when they have to perform a task after reading. Now let's see the next um, challenge which was how could I possibly write a story or a composition? I'm not a writer. I know this is not directly linked to reading, but in a way it is. Um, here, a lot of language examinations and then we in City and Guilds, we do the same. So a lot of times we feature writing tasks that are in the realm of uh, creative writing tasks, such as writing a, a short story, a story, an article, composition, something like this. And uh, very often students are sort of stunned by this and, and they say, I am not a writer. I don't know how to write. I'm not even talented to write. So how, how could I even come up with the story behind the story that I have to write? Uh, first and foremost, I tell them that the task here is not to write something that could be published. We are not looking for talent. It's not a content-based kind of thing, so they can still solve a task very well if they make sure they include a lot of good grammar, uh, they provide, you know, they, they include a lot of good range grammar, uh, they include a lot of good words, so naturally they don't have to create something which is of great value lit from a literature point of view. But uh, on the other hand, they could get a lot of inspiration if they read short stories. So if you want to be able to write a story or a short story for a language exam, well, read short stories and read what other people wrote. So um, reading literature is a very good idea. You should refer them to Project Gutenberg, not just because it's copyright free, but because this is the exact uh, site that we in City and Guilds are using uh, to locate texts that we will use in the live exam materials. So you can further enhance your chances of passing if you read some of the books that are featured on, on Project Gutenberg. Now let's have a look at the, the activities. Let's start with some basic reading activities. So how do we start? Well, we start small, naturally, at A1 level, reading instructions in the book or doing grammar-based reading materials, sh such as a short uh, closed test with to be missing. Now, I put a question mark after reading aloud because uh, quite a lot of research suggests nowadays that when students read aloud, uh, they actually cannot really understand what they are saying. So there is this element of, of A1 students struggling with pronunciation so much and the, the link between uh, letters and sounds that they will not be able to understand whatever they are saying. So while I, I think reading aloud is great, it is great not for a reading point of view at all, it's great for a pronunciation point of view, learning how to, how to pronounce individual sounds, words, learning about intonation, sentence stress, where a word finishes, where, another, where a, I don't know, a sentence finishes and another sentence starts, but it's not a good idea to make them read aloud when we are doing a comprehension task. So what I usually do with, me, with my A1 students, A1, A2 students, is that we perform the task traditionally, so they read it for themselves silently. We solve the task, so they answer the reading comprehension questions to see whether they understood what was happening. And then when we have seen and when we have tested them, we go on and read the text aloud uh, to check for pronunciation and, uh, and uh, to, to sort of practice speaking almost. Now let's see some of uh, our uh, more basic exams, the A levels, A1 and A2. This is reading part one in A1. Like I said, this is sort of a grammar-based closed test with uh, phrases missing. At A2, this gets a little bit more difficult because it's not just phrases missing. These are closes, as you can see. Um, reading part two, 
again, is a closed test with some information missing. The information could be grammar, vocabulary, or even layout in some cases. After all, this is a very basic level, so it, it's, uh, we, we are also testing layout. Um, and then in, uh, at A2 level, it gets a little bit harder. The texts are slightly longer, and the information missing is a little bit more grammary and more difficult. Uh, reading part three at A1 level looks very similar to what we have seen at, at B2 level, but obviously it's just the texts are much shorter and much easier uh, to understand, but the task is the same, matching texts to questions. The same at the A2 level, just the texts are getting a little bit longer. And the reading part four at A1 level is matching short texts, or in some cases I would even call them signs, public signs, to, to their meaning. And this this task I especially like because I think it brings a, a certain level of you know real life element into an exam, um, teaching them how to you know read uh, public signs. And uh, reading part four at A2 level is uh, is the first real <laughs> traditional reading comprehension task where we have a text with um, multiple choice questions and they have to choose the correct answer. And now let's see some more advanced reading activities. Uh, for more advanced reading activities, I will use the example of our B2 exam. Reading part one at B2 level is uh, a multiple choice type of question. It is generally testing scanning. The questions follow the order of mentioning in the text. Students are, sh are, should be encouraged to locate the questions after obviously understanding the question, locating the questions in the text, some words of the questions in the text, underlining that area, and using the dictionary only on that area. They also need to eliminate incorrect answers and uh, differentiate between opinion and fact. Reading part two at B2 level is a closed test with full sentences missing. It's a relatively difficult task because it requires a relatively conscious understanding of grammar. Students need to understand how pronominal references work, uh, how cohesion works and linking devices work. Um, and even though it's only worth six marks, I think it is worth teaching this because preparation for this task uh, teaches writing at the same time. So if they manage to master this task, uh, they might be able to improve their um, writing skills as well. So let's see some task to, to prepare students for reading part two. Well, one of the tasks, as you can see right here on the screen, is the create the gap activity, where uh, I just pick a random article that I find on the internet. Obviously, I proofread it before to check whether I can find at least three or four sentences that you can uh, remove. So I'm looking for something where there are, you know, pronominal references, but obviously almost all te texts are going to be like this, but I'm just looking for um, a level um, specific task. And then I bring uh, the article into class and I put students in groups and I ask them to actually find three or four sentences that they think they could remove and put it back because they have managed to locate some sort of reference uh, to the previous sentence. Now, I think this is a great task because it puts students um, in charge. They feel like they are actually doing something useful. And actually, they are doing something useful because if, uh, if they're good at this task, they will have created um, an activity like this that you can actually use uh, in another class. So you're applying a little bit of a, I don't know, student labor. They're doing your work for you. Um, another task I sometimes do is to put the text together. I, uh, I completely dismantle a text and they have to put it back together. You can do this at a paragraph level or at a sentence uh, level as well. And uh, another task I sometimes do is an error correction task with a pronominal reference focus. I take a, te uh, a text and I remove all, uh, um, and I replace all uh, or most pronouns with incorrect pronouns, I highlight it for them that this is incorrect and they have to correct it. This teaches them how pronouns work and obviously this is key to solving uh, part two correctly. Reading part three usually doesn't take a long time to prepare students for this. They, they understand how this works and really will score very highly on this. 
but I do teach them that they should first uh, understand the questions completely, almost through intensive reading, using the dictionary, and once they understand the questions, I also tell them to locate the answers in the text. So I usually tell them to read the question, locate the answer in one of the texts, underline that area, and number the underlined area so that they know which text what the letter of the text was, where they found the answer to this question. Uh, the first few questions usually require skimming, so general understanding of the text, so which one invites the public's opinions, which one provides information about opening time, so this is rather a skimming task, and the other few are usually uh, scanning tasks. And reading part four, is an open question task where we have maximized the acceptable words in five, so they will not be able to uh, get a mark if their answers are over length. And again, similarly to reading part one, this is a scanning task usually. The questions are in order of mentioning in the text. They have to locate the questions in the text or some of the words of the questions in the text. Like in the case of number one, they have to locate the word title in the text. Obviously, it's not as easy as this one. Sometimes word spotting is not as easy, especially not at higher levels. We might use uh, synonyms or antonyms, but in a way, uh, the questions will be in the text. They need to underline and use the target dictionary, uh, the user dictionary on the target language only. And of course, they need to make sure in this case that their answer actually answers the question. Now, just as a question, how should we uh, try to aim, try to make progress with reading skills? Well, first and foremost, I think you should use the practice papers, even at lower levels. So it doesn't matter if your students are not aiming at an A2 exam, if your students was, are aiming at B2 exam, but they are at A1 or A2 level, obviously you should try to use the practice papers to test them, to see whether they are making progress and also to teach them. This way you can give them exam-specific practice as well as skills development. Also use authentic reading materials after a, a while. Uh, you will see in a few minutes that this is especially important because you can also use this uh, to assess them, whether they can understand the authentic reading materials such as magazines, contemporary novels and news sites. Now let's move on to the next topic, which is engaging our students. Now, first question is, where is the real world? So where can students find authentic, real-life experiences with the English language? Now, obviously, English teachers uh, like us are in a privileged position because uh, English is everywhere. Obviously, that is the primary reason, reason why so many people learn it. So, of course, they can engage with the English language anywhere they want, but where is this exactly from a reading point of view? Well, they can have access to the real world through books, through emails and other communications, through magazines and newspapers, through subtitles on the film, or obviously through the internet. That is the most straightforward uh, means of um, engagement with the language for your students. On the internet they can find news, ebooks, blogs, message boards, and I really could go on uh, for weeks. Now, how should we engage our students and what does engagement with the language mean? And this is what I usually tell my students, that they need to use language spontaneously outside the classroom in an informal context, in genuine and meaningful situations. So in essence, they need to make English their own. So um, the example that I usually give them is this. They need to shift from being a language learner to a language user. Very often students think that learning and teaching is a passive process from their point of view. I am teaching, they are learning. So they are just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for knowledge to sort of pass through my brain and just magically appear in their brain. So they are sort of the sponge and, uh, and I am, I don't know, just, you know, giving them knowledge. Now, I think learning, a learning process should be more active from students' point of view 
I usually try to change their opinion about the learning process by telling them that the teacher, so myself, is only a tool. There are hundreds of other tools that they could employ every day to enhance their learning process. I'm just one of them. So they need to take hold of and take charge of their own learning process and they need to make sure that they are doing something outside the classroom with the English language because no matter how good you are you cannot teach them English unless they do something outside the classroom as well. So let's see how we can engage our students. I usually identify uh, out-of-classroom activities for them and I notify them of, of their existence. So for example I locate the English language bookshops in my own city. I know there are lots of bookshops selling English books, but I usually locate the specific English uh, language bookshops that specialize in English language or foreign languages. I locate English language ebooks online for them, either through Project Gutenberg or some others. I tell them about English language magazines, online magazines that they can read. I tell them about the English language theater available in my own city. And I also tell them about the English language cinema. We have some, uh, some cinemas in here that show films without subtitles in the original language or with subtitles. Another thing I do, uh, and I think it is important that we do this, is to monitor their engagement with the language. I do this uh, simply by first, for example, asking them what they have uh, been doing in connection with English since I last saw them. I also sometimes use a dashboard of achievements where we write down on little post-it notes what they have done since we have since we last had a class for example I started reading the news every day or last weekend I helped some tourists find uh, I don't know one of the tourist sites or I left a comment on one of the message boards where I was regularly reading or uh, I watched a film with English subtitles and, uh, and I actually make sure I ask them this regularly. And yes, sometimes it's going to be a bit embarrassing for them because they will say, well, I did nothing. Or sometimes they say, well, I did homework. But then I usually take this opportunity to explain that if they want to learn and if they want to move from learner to user, they need to use this language. And just by meeting me twice a week, they will not magically transform into uh, an English language user. They need to use it to become users. So I usually, obviously, set an example and tell them what I have done uh, in connection with English since we, I last saw them. And again, I refer back to point number one. I identify out-of-classroom activities for them, and I encourage them to, to use these uh, activities or, and opportunities. Uh, finally, I also create out-of-classroom activities for them. Naturally, this is dependent on resource, time, and energy. In the past, uh, there were times when I had the energy and time and resources to organize cultural quizzes for them and uh, stuff like this. Currently, I don't have enough time, but actually, um, you can also obviously uh, ask for the help of your colleagues and organize it together. You can organize cultural quizzes, English language quiz nights, cinema nights, book club for them. Uh, I have tried all of these and they work tremendously well. I once organized a seven round cultural quiz for my students based on the English speaking uh, cultures uh, and I combined the relatively boring quiz where you fill in a written quiz, I combined it with a bit more tangible uh, part. Every round they were given a, a task such as for the American round they had to bake American cakes and cookies and it's actually much more fun to fill in a quiz when you're eating cheesecake, brownie or muffins. Um, and they really loved it and uh, there was a crazy big demand uh, from almost every student from every class in the school where I did this. So it is a pretty good idea actually. But of course it depends on, on resources and time. But what does not uh, depend on resources is identifying out of classroom activities for them and monitoring their engagement with the language. Now just a few words about online reading, just bearing in mind that we are trying to make them uh, use the language. Don't forget to refer them to Project Gutenberg um, and just remind them that uh, these articles uh, that are adapted from newspapers and magazines will be used and some of them will be used uh, to create our, our exams, so the City and Guilds exams, so there is a point in, in, in using Project Gutenberg. 
uh, also help them choose a magazine they can choose a magazine of their choice obviously so if they love running probably they should give up reading their native language edition of the runner magazine and use, uh, choose the original or if they like cooking like I do they could buy uh, the BBC Good Food magazine or Jamie Oliver's cookery magazine and read that and of course you can also refer them to breakingnewsenglish.com but there are plenty of other websites that they can use for actual reading comprehension tasks. Um, I want to recommend you one site in particular. This is newsmap.jp. This is a news aggregator site that uh, refreshes itself every few minutes and it's basically going through Google searches and um, it basically ha has a look at what people are reading and what are the most popular searches uh, on the internet. I love this site for several reasons. First of all, I think it's a very good motivator that you are reading what everybody else is reading. The bigger the letters, the more people are reading it. The smaller the letters, the fewer people are reading it. Um, another good thing is that you can choose countries using these tabs and then you will get the country specific uh, news. We have quite a lot of English speaking countries featured here. Canada, Australia, India, um, United States, UK, there, so there are quite a lot of these, but they can also use choose the topic that they're interested in because the colors signify a certain topic. This one is uh, international news, that's national news, that is sports news, this is I think um, technology, so they can choose the topic that they're interested in. And another interesting um, thing about this uh, website is that it will lead your students to different websites all the time because even when I encourage them to read the news sometimes they just read BBC News which is amazing that's a great thing but if you think about it BBC is one company it employs a finite set of journalists who usually use the same a journalistic and linguistic style but it's a good idea to you know familiarize them with uh, with different reading uh, writing styles and this way you might be able to see it I know it's tiny but you might be able to see that this particular article is from the Telegraph uh, quite a lot of these articles will be from a different uh, magazine and quite a lot of these magazine I magazines I would never have uh, reached without this website I sometimes uh, use this uh, website as a, I basically set homework from this, so I just tell them pick one article every week and report on it. Um, it's a really, really good website, I think. Now, let's finish off uh, today's training with talking about providing feedback and assessment. Obviously, assessment of reading only. First and foremost, you can use CFR uh, for assessment purposes. Um, what you can see are the can-do statements from ranging from A1 to C2 level for um, reading only. Now, I know that sometimes um, people say that CFR is not tangible enough, it's a little bit vague, but to prove them wrong, I have highlighted uh, read all the very specific real-life examples of what CFR expects, expects students to be able to understand. And I think this makes CFR very tangible. It also makes it uh, um, sort of um, useful for self-assessment purposes. So students can very easily see where their reading skills are, basically just by asking themselves, can I understand posters and catalogs? Yes, I can. Okay. Can I very easily understand menus, advertisements, or maybe, I don't know, prospectuses? Um, can I understand full texts, maybe? Simple texts, but full texts, not just menus, full texts. If I can, then I can I am probably at least B1 level. Can I read articles online? Can I easily read articles online and understand uh, most of it? Or can I pick up a book, contemporary literary prose, and understand it? If I can't, then this is probably um, it, this probably means I am not at B2 level or I am at the lower level of B2. The same goes for C1, if I can understand specialized articles or complex factual and literary texts, I am probably at C1 level. But if I am aiming at a C1 exam and I still can't really understand anything from a, a non-abridged, original, authentic book or an article, then that's probably bad news because I am a few, quite a few levels below that. So using CFR for uh, assessment is a very, very good idea and it's not as vague uh, as people say it is. 
Now, um, how shall we approach uh, assessment of reading? First, first of all, I would like to encourage you to provide clear feedback on their development per skill regularly. You, should do, you can do this with the help of the can-do statements, but you can also do this with the help of city and guilds practice papers. If they could pass a mock exam, then they are generally at that level. Um, when testing a skill, make sure that you limit the use of the other skills uh, to get reliable results. What this means is that a good language exam and a good uh, test tests only that given skill and limits the use of other skills. So, for example, when we are testing speaking skills, we should probably not make students read a lot because then what if their reading skills are not good enough? This might result in a, in a bad marks for a spoken exam. Uh, or when we are testing reading skills, we should limit writing, so we should not ask them to answer in full sentences because what if they are lacking in their writing skills? This might have an effect on the results of their reading test. So limit the other skills. That's why in our exams we have a lot of multiple choice uh, answers. We want only short answers in a note-taking format, and all our questions are relatively short as well. And uh, what about our own assessment of the exam? So the, the exam, uh, the assessment of the city and girls exams uh, with regards to the reading section, we mark the reading section with a paper-specific mark scheme. Um, when it comes to reading part four with the open questions, we accept misspelled words and American spelling only where the word is clearly recognizable as the correct answer. So, for example, if the correct answer was heat, hit is unacceptable since it is another existing word uh, in the language. We will not accept answers exceeding the maximum words stated in the rubric. So, when it comes to B1, it, this is a maximum of three. When it comes to B2 and above, it's going to be five words, and we will not accept anything high, uh, above this. Um, and we will not accept two answers if and if one of them is, in fact, the correct answer. So, please try to tell your students not to write irrelevant information. Just keep the question answer the question, otherwise they may end up losing a point if the irrelevant part of their answer is not just irrelevant, but incorrect. Right, I have actually finished with everything I, ha I wanted to say today. Um, do you have any questions with, with anything I was talking about, or anything that you, you thought I would cover, but I didn't? No? Okay, so if there are no, no questions, then I would like to thank you for participating in this training today. Um, you will receive the presentation that we have watched today, and if you have any questions, please just feel free to contact us, uh, us anytime. So thank you very much for participating, and uh, have a lovely afternoon.